Maybe uh, I had asked you about the two young tight ends, Zach Coombs and and Brenton, who had gotten bigger, your thoughts on them. And also, I I don't want you to have to repeat everything, but uh, we didn't get to hear a lot of how you were kind of managing uh, your job, your profession, and your relationships in the spring through this difficult time. If you could go back to that, we'd appreciate it. Okay, I'll start with the second question from the first time. Um, So can everyone hear me? And if, if we can't, just interrupt me in the middle of it so we can make sure we – Thumbs up, everybody. Thumbs up. Okay. Yep. Okay, um, you know, as far as Zach and Brenton, you mentioned it. I think a big part of their development has been, you know, physical maturity. Uh, but I've also seen both of those guys mature emotionally um, and mentally from a football standpoint since they've been on campus. I, I think you, you said it best uh, when stating the original question. I think that's shaping up to be a very important position battle on our offensive unit this year um, with Nick Bowers leaving, uh, finding a replacement. Obviously, you guys see we're going to utilize multiple tight ends at the position. Um, But I've been very pleased with Zach and Brenton, how they've approached it. Zach, the you know, really his first two years here in Brenton for a year, uh, just how they've approached it in the weight room, how they've approached it in the classroom. And I think they're both uh, shaping up to, to have a pretty special practice session whenever we get that back going. I almost said spring, but whenever we get back uh, practicing again, and I'm excited for both of them, and and that'll be an important battle. Um, as far as you asked about the challenges of this, you know, I think the the biggest thing, um, the, you know, kind of restating what I said the first time, the biggest thing is we know this is much bigger than Penn State football, college football, uh, sports as a whole. Um, you know, I think about our spring athletes, you know, our hearts go out to, to some of the seniors whose senior seasons got cut short and, and things of that nature. Um, obviously, it's, it's a challenge and we all wish that, uh, that normal life was going on, but we're involved with something much bigger. Um, you know, from a chat, we know all the challenges of it. I guess the thing that I've tried to do with, with my room is uh, make, make them approach it as an opportunity. I think one thing this has done is, is made me focus on, you know, how, how can I relay information to my players better? I think about, you know, in the digital world where everything's on demand with a podcast or pulling up a Netflix show or uh, looking at Twitter for news or Instagram, everything is on demand for those guys right at their fingertips. So it's forced me to really think, uh, are, are there ways that I could be relaying information to them better from coach to player? Um, so I've kind of spent some time not only utilizing technology for Zoom meetings, very similar that we're doing right now, so we get that face-to-face interaction and we know how the guys are doing, but also spending some time and me putting together some coaching points on demand. So maybe instead of listening to a, uh, a podcast in between classes, we might be able to listen to a pass install. Um, so I think it's just made me think of ways to to be better once this all ends and we get back to a little bit more of a normal schedule. I think there's a way that they can digest information better, much different than when I was in college. So I think I've, we we spent our time approaching that as an opportunity, and me asking them, hey, how can I how can I help you better? Um, because you know we're having we're we're using this out of necessity, but obviously this is something that they're accustomed to doing all the time. So I think it's made 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 me and our staff uh, better coaching staff. Next up, we have Tyler Dada here, Lions two four seven. Hey Tyler, hope you and your family are well. Thanks, same to you, Tyler. I appreciate that. Uh, getting to the man on top of that depth chart, Pat Fryermuth. Um, you've worked with him now two years. What are the expectations for you, year three? Um, know you think very highly of him. And how is he setting the tone as, as a team leader, you know, captain last year with everybody scattered across the country? How important are guys like Pat and keeping the accountability going? Yeah, obviously our, our leadership uh, on our team is very important right now just from an accountability standpoint. Uh, I do think we have, we have good shared accountability within the team, but I, I know Pat – for our unit and for the, for our uh, position unit, um, you know, he's been instrumental and in just, just checking in on guys and, and being a big brother to maybe younger guys that don't know how to work the same way that haven't been in the program as long that aren't as emotionally mature. Um, I think he's been a, a huge help for that as have all of our leadership team and, and throughout the program. I do think we, you know, with that being said, I do think we have good shared accountability as far as what these guys 
want to do as a team, what their personal goals are, what their collective goals are. And there's a standard of excellence that I, that I do feel, um, even though we're away and we're all spread out across the country, I do feel we're living up to that. Um, as far as expectations for Pat, um, you know, and it's going to be a little bit of the same boring answer. I just want him to continue improving. Um, and I think he would tell you the same thing. Um, you know, I think the big things that we worked on last year coming into his second year were just details in his route running, um, just just various details. I, I would say that he's a above the line route runner at the tight end position when you look nationally. Um, and then I think the biggest thing that he's focused on is how can I be the best all around tight end in the country? And that's the message to him. How can I be the best tight end at pass protection? How can I be the best tight end in the run game? How can I be the best tight end in the pass game? How can I be the best tight end in screens? Every facet of tight end play, he has the skill set to excel at. So I think the big thing for him is putting it all together. He's been able to put together little bits and pieces in his career. And now being able to have a little bit of a toolbox to put it all together and be the best all around tight end in the conference for him and in the country, I think that's his goal. But we're, we're just working on that in every area. Next up is Audrey Snyder with The Athletic. Hey, Tyler. Good morning. Hey, Audrey. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for doing this. Uh, I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about the recruiting ramifications of everything that's going on here. I'm sure that's uh, been quite a headache for you guys to sort through. What's maybe been some of the biggest challenges from that end? Um, and should we get to a point where camps get impacted? Uh, what would you guys lose by not having that? Um. From as far as the ramifications of it, I think, you know, I, maybe I look at it a little different. I'm, I'm a glass half full guy. Really, the only thing that I see we're losing at this point in time is just having guys on campus. I mean, that's it. Um, you know, FaceTimes, that's been a huge part of the recruiting process for me ever since I started recruiting. Um, you know, so I think utilizing that technology, that's something we've been accustomed to. And hopefully it's forced guys to do it even more. Um, you know, I've looked at that as more of an opportunity. There's more time. At the same time, there's more time for other coaches. So everybody's pulling at these prospects from different angles. They also have virtual school, so their their schedules aren't really that much different. But we're really using the losing the ability for guys to get on campus, interact with our coaching staff as a whole in person, have their families interact with our coaching staff and whole uh, as a person in person. Uh, view of practice. Uh, I think you get a good feel when guys are on campus in the spring, uh, normally for practice of what the culture's like, how competitive is it. I think those are things that an elite prospect wants to see. Those are the things we're losing. As far as everything else, it's kind of business as usual as it would be in any other dead period um, with the with the communication through uh, phone calls with what's allowed with the rules and text messages and things of that nature. Um, so I think you know, those have been the challenge. I think you bring up a good point that uh, that's in the back of all of our minds. If this affects camps, I think that's a that's a, a major effect to the recruiting process, um, a hurdle that we have to overcome. I think we value uh, camps here. Uh, I know here at Penn State and I know people do around the country. I think of, you know, a lot of our players that have been household names here that have gone on the NFL. They all started as a rising junior at a camp at Penn State right here in Happy Valley, and they, they put up a time and were able to coach them, were able to see how they learn. Uh, you just get a good feel. No different than they get a good feel for us as coaches when they're out of practice. We get a great feel for them when we're coaching them out of camp. So I do think that's something that we've, that we've got to look at going forward. How does that affect it? Are there other ways that we can see that information? I think uh, another recruiting hurdle, right, is, is not getting out on the road or maybe, hey, I've got a guy from a uh, further distance away that I'm not going to get to camp, but I can go watch him practice. I can go watch him work out. I can get a live evaluation in the evaluation period of the spring. That's another thing that's lost. So just trying to piece that all together and, uh, you know, just got to work hard with people that you trust to form a picture of the prospect that's going to give you the most information available to make a, to make a low-risk decision. Rich Garcella, Reading Eagle. Good morning, Tyler. Thanks for doing this. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you, guys. Um, with Kirk coming on board and developing and a new offense, so to speak, how much does it 
hurt you guys that you weren't able to get on the field for spring practice? Well, I think, you know, when you say, you know, how much does it hurt us? It can't hurt us. Um, we, we, we can't allow it to. I, I, I commend Kirk. Kirk, came, Kirk has been awesome. Um, I've enjoyed learning uh, from him since he's been here. I think the beauty of Kirk coming in, he's a guy that's done it at a high level for a very long time. Everywhere he's been, he's been able to build a program up that on, on offense that maybe was a bottom dweller and they end up towards the top. You know, when you look at national statistics, same thing with quarterbacks, um, everywhere he's been. So I think the beauty of him coming in is this isn't something that we've had to piece together. It's been a very clear concise plan since day one. So with that, I think we were able to utilize our time on campus with our players before all of this happened and we maximized it. Now the trick is, is just continuing that maximization. Now the one thing that you're going to lose, right, that, that can't be, that can't be made up is watching a guy make a mistake full speed from the meeting room and then being able to correct it. And, and, you know, I don't know what the answer for that is I would say that we, we can't let it be an issue. Um, it's not going to be an excuse um, for us on offense, even though maybe we're, we could be a little further behind the defense just from a rep standpoint. These guys are maybe doing something a little bit different, a tweak here or there. Um, but I think our guys have got a good foundation. We're continuing to, to build that foundation with what we're doing through technology during this time. And uh, the bottom line is we can't let it be an issue. Um, and, and that's kind of been our approach. That's been our players' approach. And I think they've approached it with a level of maturity that, that I do see that happening. Whenever we get back out on the field, we've got, to have, we've got to have utilized our time better than other programs to hit the ground running. And that's been our mindset. Thanks. Great. Greg Pickle, Penn Live. Hey, Coach. How you doing? Doing good. How about you? I'm good. Hey, I'm sorry. I joined the call a little bit late. So if I repeat something you already asked, I apologize. Sorry about that. I think I had two mics going. But okay. um, Brenton Strange is a guy that we saw a little bit last year. What kind of gains did he make to over the winter? Uh, he, 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 he's made, he's continued to make strides. You know, the big thing uh, since he's been on campus, I think he showed up at 211. He's in the 240s now. Um, just watching his physical maturity. Um, he's always carried with him a little bit of an emotional maturity, even as a early enrollee freshman. I don't think he ever missed a beat transitioning to, uh, to the college level, whether that be school, practice. Uh, he's, got a, he's got a very good work ethic. Um, so th those are the things that I've seen from him. I, I think the biggest thing that I've seen grow from him, you know, year one for a player, a lot of times it's catching up. You know, we, we talk about coaching in three phases in our room, right? It's, it's who and what, it's how and why, right? So who and what, who do I block, what route do I run? Second part that we spend the most of our time on, right, is how do I do it, right? That's a very important part technically. And then the last piece is why am I doing it within the scheme, within the bigger picture, going macro to micro. I've really seen his development come from that last part, that why. I think he was doing a nice job in the who and what and the how, now he's been able to take a macro concept and bring it down to a micro level. And, and I'm watching that mature. Like he, now he can tell me what multiple positions on the field are doing. Well, that, that helps him paint a bigger picture. It helps him relate it to the defenses that we're seeing and his knowledge of that will help him react faster. So I, I've been very impressed with his work on that this off season. And I can tell that it's, it's something he spent time on. Next, we have Mike Gross from Lancaster. Hi, Tyler. Thanks for doing this today. Um, <clears throat> uh, you kind of, to some extent, answered this already, but I, your, obs your observations of Kirk uh, ingratiating himself to the coaching staff and to the players in what are really unusual, unprecedented circumstances. Yeah. I, it, it kind of goes back to me as I, I just think Kirk's Kirk's a guy. He's got such a clear vision of what this Penn State offense is going to be. I, I really feel that we didn't there. There wasn't a hiccup of time when he showed up on campus. Um, I, I think we were able to utilize our time. And really what we were t what, what you're talking about, what we didn't miss is we got our full block before uh, spring break. Right. So from. 
day one, those guys got back on campus after the bowl game to spring break. That time was was sacred. We knew we were going to have that time. We knew because of, of a change at offensive coordinator, how, how are we going to utilize that time best? And I think we were able to maximize that piece of time. Now, going forward from that, he was able to kind of ingratiate himself to the players and the coaching staff during that time with the, with the amount that we can work with our players, the two hours a week during the eight-hour period and all those things. Now, going forward, we've got that great foundation. Well, now he's been able to take that in. It's unprecedented, but uh, utilizing technology, um, you know, he's been at the forefront of that. I know not only in the quarterback room, but with the entire offense. And I really think with what we've been allowed to do, we haven't missed a beat. And, I, you know, maybe I'm – again, I'm a glass half full guy, but I, I look at the way our players are engaged. I look at the way our players respond to him, not only with what we're doing schematically, but him as a motivator and the experience that he, he brings and the knowledge that he brings offensively. He's, he's one of the few coordinators that I've been around, not, not that I've been coaching forever, but that I've been around that really knows every position in great detail, um, right? A, a lot of coordinators, right, they can piece together a concept, but they maybe know one position in great detail. Uh, you know, you listen to him talk, you know, he can go up and be a guy that, that coaches the offensive lineman on his first two steps and then go talk about the receiver split and what release he should take against inside leverage press coverage. Like he's got that wealth of knowledge with, with his experience. So I think that's helped them really acclimate to our players well because he's hands-on and coaching them uh, throughout putting in this system. So, I, you know, I think with what we've been able to do, he's done a tremendous job. And I know our players and our coaching staff have, have really enjoyed not only coaching with him, but also uh, learning some, some new tools that we can add to this offense. Ben Jones, statecollege.com. Hey, Tyler, thanks for taking the time to do this. Um, the inevitable elephant in the room here is that nobody knows whether football is going to be back. You don't know. We don't know. And the players don't know. When somebody comes to you and says, you know, what is going on? How do you kind of manage that while at the same time, you know, inevitably you can only prepare for what you know. Um, so how do you kind of manage those two things at the same time? I look at it one, one way, task at hand, singleness of purpose. So every day I've, I've got tasks to accomplish. Um, I've got a singleness of purpose that I plan on at some point. We're going to be back with our players. I plan on at some point from a football standpoint that we're going to play games this season, um, that we're going to open up and play. And, and my goal is that there, there, is no, there is no excuse in our room uh, there's no reason for any type of drop off in performance. We're all dealt the same deck of cards and, and ultimately it's going to come down when we do play football again, whenever that is, I, you know, I read all the, every, every article there is every day about it. Um, obviously it's something on our mind at the same time. It's, it's honestly something that's not that important in the grand scheme of things, but that is our job. Right. And that is ultimately why our players are here, not only to get education, play football. So I've just tried to challenge our position room. Um, I know we've challenged our staff just to focus every day. Hey, we've got tasks. We plan on playing games again. And ultimately it's going to be on who best utilizes this time and prepares, which I think we're in a great position from our leadership uh, in our program from coach Franklin on down to maximize this time. So that, that's kind of how we've looked at it and how I've challenged our players to look at it. Dubai Wilborn, Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Hey, hey, um, coach, how are you, man? Uh, first good time actually meeting you. Um, that being said, within the realm of recruiting, if there's a situation where you guys may have more scholarship athletes than originally, have you even thought about how to handle that or is there even talks about how to deal with that kind of situation? Say, say that again. I will restate the question that you're saying. If, if we end up having more scholarship spots available than we originally planned, is that the question? Yes, because of because like, for instance, with the spring sports or allowing them extra el eligibility, if that happens in football, have you, you thought about that? Yeah. Uh, you know, I probably hadn't got too far down that yet. Um, you know, I, for, for, for me, from an offensive recruiting standpoint, you know, when, when I'm looking at, at what we do recruiting-wise from a number standpoint, it's all needs by number, right? We're all trying to reach a certain number goal of scholarship players per position, and then beyond that, a certain number of total players 
per position when you talk about our, our run-ons. Um, so, no, not something that I've thought about uh, a ton. Obviously, that would affect the numbers drastically. Um, at the same time, if they haven't made that decision at, at, from at this you know, at this point in time, I don't know how you could penalize guys that are committed to you uh, to play football from an NCAA standpoint and maybe take off numbers and tell kids they, that we're full and, and you can't come aboard. So I, I don't know. That that would be something I, I think there would have to be special legislation with what you could do scholarship numbers-wise, um, but probably not not far enough along at that point yet. John Padishnock, happyvalley.com. Hey, good morning, Tyler. Hope everything is well for you and your family and appreciate the time. Same to you, John. Thanks. Hey, as you talk to players, what do you see your role being in helping them make sense and process what's happening around the world with this pandemic? And have you had a different message to them simply because none of us have experienced anything like this before? Yeah, I, th I think the first message is, is, is right, the, the big strength in this is let, you know, as a coach, um, as a husband, as someone who's obviously in that room with those guys on a daily basis and now in a Zoom room with them, is I think, you know, some of our biggest strength is our vulnerability and, and being able to have conversations with these guys. Um, because, you know, I, I said it a little bit initially, I think I was cutting in and out. This touches all of us in a different way, uh, whether someone in our family uh, gets the virus or someone we know gets laid off from work, or you know, it, it, it touches every one of us in some sort of way, and it's gonna to continue to do that as, as it goes through. So I think just, just being vulnerable with them, having those conversations, sharing stories, um, you know, and that we're all going through this for the first time together. And I think that, that's what we've ultimately been able to do to get positives out of this is really, you know, they've challenged me as a coach, and I've challenged them as players, like how, how can we get the most out of this? You know, not only from an emotional health standpoint, from our football standpoint, and then also obviously them academically at students, which I think Penn State's done an unbelievable job. I, like, I don't feel our guys missed a beat in that department. But I, but I think the biggest thing to answer your question, we're all going through it for the first time. I think it's important that they know that. I think it's important that they know uh, we don't have all the answers, um, but we will update them as information comes available and that it's okay to, to be vulnerable and have conversations because I think that's important for all of us. We still need that face-to-face -face interaction for our emotional health. Um, I know we probably all feel that sitting here at home right now. Um, you know, we still, that, that, that's still how we operate. So I think that's been the message to those guys outside of football that, hey, this is something new and we're, we're gonna approach it no different than we're gonna approach any other hurdle in the football program, or hopefully they go on and approach any other hurdle in their life, is we're going to deal with it. We're going to take facts. We're going to approach it day by day and and continue moving on. Donnie Collins, Times Tribune. Hey, Tyler. Thanks for doing this this morning. Um, no problem. Thank you. I, I understand that Theo Johnson wasn't going to be able to do anything on the field this spring, but what, what was your plan for kind of bringing him along in, you know, this semester and, 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 you know, how has that changed, uh, you know, over the, over, over the last couple of weeks? Yeah, I think the, the big thing for him, right. It, just like any other early enrollees is number one thing, getting acclimated to, to college early. I, I did think that he came in with a, with a nice emotional maturity. And from that standpoint that I don't ever feel like the transition from, you know, coming from high school to now college was ever a, a huge hurdle for him when I, when I think about how he's approached this first semester. Even having the, his first semester, he shows up, he has some adversity his first week, and then now he's finishing the semester virtually. Um, and, I, and I've really been impressed with the way he's handled it. Um, you know, the big thing for his development this spring, right, is getting him up to speed um, from a playbook standpoint in the football game and then also for whatever he can do to, to be healthy and, and, and get as strong as he can in the weight room, which he, which he came in with a nice foundation. Um, very similar to Pat from a physical maturity standpoint. He's a year older uh, coming out of high school with kind of how the, the Canadian uh, high school works. So um, really, you know, other than being face-to-face -face with him, when we can utilize those hours that the NCAA lets us have, uh, we really haven't missed a beat. I've spent time with him as a first-year player, 
one-on-one, -on -one, getting him caught up with not only the playbook, but there's things that, that those guys have to understand from just a general football standpoint, teaching them defense, um, teaching them, you know, what we call our technique, being able to speak the same language that's important that we have, you know, we have clear communication across the board that helps us coach faster, helps them correct faster. So I think all those things, we're on track. Obviously, the things that you're not going to know until we're able to get back out and play football is, hey, okay, I understood it this way. This is how I digested it. This is what I produced for you physically, and then now I have to correct it, right? There, there's no way I can't. I can't do that, right? So that's the one thing that we're missing. But we were going to miss that anyway. So I think the big thing is is just focusing on him, making sure he's, uh, you know, you know, from a football knowledge standpoint, and then from a playbook standpoint, as ready as he'll ever be when we, whenever we do play football again. Time for a couple more. Uh, John Sauber, Center Daily Times. Hi, uh, Tyler. Hope all's well. Uh, do you sort of view yourself as a bridge between offenses because you have so much experience in the last offense? And what's your role been in blending these offenses together? Um, I, I guess in, in some ways. I, I think the biggest thing that, that, I've, that I've always prided myself on, um, and obviously this is a, a big thing that I, was, I got from Coach Franklin when I was a player from him, is, is that, hey, I want to be a lifelong learner. Um, so, you know, I've been involved. I've been fortunate early on in my coaching career when I was a grad assistant at Maryland and kind of working through, I was involved on a lot of bad offenses, but a lot of different offenses. I think we had coordinator turnover every year. Um, so from that, whether a guy was leaving to go get another job or a guy got let go, all that stuff, I was involved with a lot of offenses early in my career. And there's the one thing I know, there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Okay, so um, I think the biggest thing I've tried to do is Kirk's came in is really approach everything with an open mind and digest it. Hey, is there something that we did that can add and blend the offenses together, which is I, I think is is what we're trying to do here. Um, are there a lot of things that that maybe I'm learning that hey, this is a better way to do it. I think the biggest thing is we've all just tried to approach it with an open mind, and I'm a big believer is is Coach Chirac is the offensive coordinator. And that's his role, and I'm going to blind faith buy in. But that's, a, that's the only way that we're going to get anything done. Um, if, if there's there's obviously going to be discussions that happen, but ultimately it, it's my job as an assistant to help him and help our team best is that, hey, he comes in, I'm blind faith bought in. When we, when we decide something, that's our decision. Uh, it's not just his, it's, it's all of us. And same thing with the players. It's all of us. It's our offense. We all touch it. So I think that's the biggest thing. Approach it with open mind and blind faith buy-in. And I've, I've been really pleased. Like I said, uh, you know, he's had so much experience doing it at a high level. Um, I think everyone will be very pleased. I, I know I am, you know, just from a knowledge standpoint and learning from him every day so far. Last one, Nate Bauer, Blue White Illustrated. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Um, I feel like you've kind of already touched on this a little bit, but if if you had to put yourself in the shoes of your players, um, do you feel like the biggest challenges would be from the mental side of things when they get back or from the physical side of things? Um, it's hard to say. I think it probably depends on each player. Um, I, I, do, I, do, I really do feel there's been great shared accountability with what our guys are doing. I think they're still highly motivated. Um, obviously, the longer this thing goes, you know, uh, just like we're, we're all human, motivation wanes here and there. What is, the, what is the outlook out in front? And I think that's why we've tried to focus so much on, hey, what can, what can I do today to make myself better from a football standpoint, academically, whatever I'm doing? So, you know, how can I approach today? Because at some point, we will do all of these things again. At some point, life will return to normal. Uh, knock on wood. So um, that, that's been the message to those guys. But I think you probably, just like anything, just like coming off of, of maybe a couple of days off of a bye week or a, a Sunday off in camp or, the, uh, or a, a Saturday, Sunday without practice during spring, I think there's going to just be a little bit of rust. Um, what are things that cannot be replicated? Timing, right? Timing in the past game can't be replicated. Um, how the backside of the offensive line is pushing a zone block and, and how the running back's going to press it and jump cut. Um, like those things, you know, it doesn't matter how many drills we do on a bag, 
how many videos they send me of, of running routes uh, at, a, at a field or in their backyard. I'm not going to be able to replicate Sean Clifford, you know, throwing a post to Pat Firemouth. I, I, I can't get it done, and they can't get it done. They're in two different spots. So I think there's going to be that, that rust is probably the biggest thing that I worry about, that we've got to come back, we've got to oil up and get shook off as quick as possible. At the same time, though, it's kind of been the message to the guys is we're not dealing with anything different than any other program, right? So, so how, how can we maximize our time and maximize each day to make sure that when we come back, we're minimizing that rust that's built up on the engine so we can get back cranking at full speed.